Hi everybody, very welcome to Mentor and yet another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the video, we're going to be talking about jet engines, specifically how they are fitted onto the wings and why those fittings are actually not as strong as the rest of the structure. We're also going to be answering a viewer question about why we don't have the engines incorporated into the wings anymore, so stay tuned. Wind 31016, This video is brought to you in cooperation with Brilliant. Now, if you are like me, you've been spending the last few weeks trying desperately to come up with good ideas on how to improve yourself with all this extra time that you have. And in that case, I highly recommend you to check out Brilliant. They have more than 60 different courses in areas like, for example, problem solving, like brain puzzles and mathematical fundamentals and physics and how to, you can build your own algorithm. The way that they do this is they enter you in on a fairly easy level and then they give you tools for each step to get more and more advanced until you sit there and you solve problems that you never thought you were able to do. Now, those of you who are interested in checking this out, you can use this link here below, which is uh, brilliant.org slash mentorpilot, and that will give you 20% off the annual fee of Brilliant. But remember, you have to be quick, because it's only the first 1,000 people that use this link that will get the, uh, the discount. So, check it out. All right, my friends, so engines, how they are fitted to the aircraft, why they look like they do, why they're fitted where they are. I could spend hours talking to you about the technical bits of this. And in fact, I have already made a video about the placement of the engine. So if you're interested in that, I'm gonna to link to it up here. You can check out that video after this. But the first thing I want to talk about is a question that I got in from one of my Patreons actually. And he was wondering, why did we stop to incorporate the engines into the wings? looks really cool when you do, doesn't it? Now, there are several good reasons why this happened, and I'm guessing that you guys can probably think of a few. But the main ones were, um, if you look back at the first ever kind of purposely built jet passenger aircraft, which was the, the Haviland Comet, it had the jet engines incorporated into the wings, and it looked really, really slick. But the problem, well, the problems are many. So, for example, if you want the engines to be inside of the wing, you need to create a box for those engines to be inside, which has to be really, really strong. And it also has to be giving a little bit of margin so that if you have an engine fire, for example, it won't be that dangerous to the rest of the wing structure. That's complicated. Also, if you are going to build that box inside of the, um, of the wing, it means that that part of the wing cannot be used for fuel. And if you think about it, the largest amount of fuel that we have on jet aircraft is going to be in kind of the center of the wing, close to the body where the wing is thickest. So effectively, by putting the engines inside there instead, you will be reducing the overall range of the aircraft. Now, on top of that, you have things like, for example, accessing the, um, the engine for maintenance, which would be a pain. And also, um, as you've seen lately, the bigger you build the engines, the more efficient they become, the more bypass ratio they get. And that's not really a problem if you're using an engine that is more or less pure turbojet engine. But if you want a turbofan engine, you can't have it inside of the wing. So that's the reason for that. But I'm, I'm really glad that you guys are sending these questions in. Now, what I want to focus on on this video um, is how the jet engines are actually held onto the pylons and why that connection is not as strong as the rest of the uh, aircraft structure. When I'm finished with this video, towards the end, we're gonna be looking at two different case studies where a failure to this system, in one way or another, led to an accident and why that happened. But first of all, the engines, the jet engines, the podded jet engines, as we call them now, which are hanging under the wings, they are connected to the wing with something called a pylon. Pylon is a very strong structure. It is bolted onto the forward wing spar normally and towards the back of the wing. And that part of the, uh, of the engine assembly is very, very strong. 
Okay. The reason that you need a pylon in the first place is because you don't want the actual engine to be so close to the wing. For the same reasons that we talked about when it came to having the, the engines inside of the wing. You need to have a bit of distance between the engine and the wing in case there will be an uncontained engine failure or an engine fire to protect the wing structure and the fuel inside. Right? So you want to build a little bit of a distance in between. Also, the fact that the engines are hanging down and a little bit forward is good from a structural point of view for the wings. That they're out there hanging means that it, it stops the wing from bending too much. And also the fact that it's a little bit in front of the wing stops some of the torque of the wings from happening. So there are structural reasons for this. When the engines are then connected to the, uh, the pylons, it is connected at least on the 737, in two different fittings. They're called hanger fittings, and you have one that is bolted onto the fan casing of the engine, and the second one that is bolted onto the turbine section of the, um, the engine. And in between those two fittings, you have something called a thrust link. And that thrust link is there in order to to transfer some of the thrust forces from the forward fitting that normally takes up most of that uh, force onto the back fitting, so it equals out the, uh, the forces. So what forces are we talking about? This might be interesting. All right, there are two main forces, um, well basically three, that these fittings have to take up. You have the thrust, which is the, by far the biggest force. That's the, the thrust that the engine is actually you know, producing when we put maximum takeoff thrust on, um, and that's on a 737 about 100 kilonewtons, right? So you have to have a fitting that takes that up. And then you have the weight, okay? The weight um, of a 737 engine is about two tons, so 2,000 kilos, that means 20 kilonewtons. But of course, that's not all of the weight that you have to take into account. You also have to imagine that at some point, the pilots might be doing a hard landing, for example. So there's a little bit of G loading onto that. Let's say that you get about three Gs, or so worst case scenario, 5Gs, okay? If you get a 5G landing and you have 20 kilonewtons of weight, it means another 100 kilonewtons. So that's 100 kilonewtons forward and maybe 100 kilonewtons down. And then you have a little bit of torque on the, uh, the uh, engine as well for different reasons, because of the movements of the engine, because of the movements of the fan, things like that, uh, which is smaller than those two forces. So what kind of forces can these fittings actually take then? Now, I've already told you that it's less than the overall structure of the aircraft, but the, the fittings are held in place by four bolts in the forward fitting and four bolts in the back, so eight bolts in total. And in the forward um, hanger fitting, you have two shear pins. Those are basically pins that are sitting in holes that takes up some of the, the thrust force, and you have one shear pin at the back. Right? That's because most of the, uh, the, the thrust force is sitting on the forward fitting. And some of it, because of the thrust link, is on the back fitting as well. All right? So these are the things that are holding the engines in place. Now, these bolts are made of a special nickel alloy called Inconel 718. It's a super strong alloy. And this alloy has a tensile strength of about 180 newtons per square millimeter, right? They're about 22 millimeters thick, which means that one bolt will take about 70 kilonewton, right? So 70 kilonewtons per bolt, there are eight bolts, that's 560 kilonewtons. And as we already talked about, the, the forces that the engine will normally encounter is a maximum of about 100 kilonewtons forward and 100 kilonewtons down. So the 560 gives a big margin of, you know, uh, of forces to be able, that this uh, engine can be able to encounter before it becomes a structural problem. However, 560 kilonewtons is not that much if you look at the overall strength of the aircraft. So for example, the amount of strength that the wings can take or some part of the body can take. And there's a really, really good reason for that if you think about it. When we come in and land, let's say that we would come in and we would have some kind of problems with our landing gear. So we can't extend the landing gear. Or we would have an unsafe landing gear, so it could potentially um, collapse once we got down on the ground or 
if something would be wrong with our calculations and we would overrun the runway. Well, what would happen then is that it's likely that, that what would hit the ground first is going to be the engine nacelles. When the engine nacelles hits the ground, there's going to be much more force than 560 kilonewtons acting on those bolts. And that will shear the engines off. They will fall off the wings as it impacts. Now, it is much, much better that the engine shears off than if they would be so strong that they would actually tear the wing off. Because if the wing would be torn off, then you would have a huge fuel leak coming up. And if both wings are torn off, in the case of, for example, a faulty uh, landing gear, well, then you have nothing stabilizing the aircraft in the right orientation. And you might get the aircraft body to start to roll, which could cause a lot of human um, damage. All right. So this is why you have this system. It's very, very closely calculated to make sure that it can take any force that the aircraft might ever you know be subjected to you know heavy turbulence severe turbulence hard landings anything like that but if it comes in contact with the ground then it will shear the engines off in order to save the overall structure of the aircraft ingenious isn't it now i promised as well that we were going to talk about some case studies um, where the systems of pylons and um, bolts didn't work as expected and the most famous example of that is probably American Airlines Flight 191 that took off out of Chicago O'Hare Airport in May of 1979. So what happened on that occasion was that the aircraft took off and uh, during the later part of the takeoff roll, the left-hand engine just completely detached from the aircraft. It swung over the... Um, the wing on the left hand side and while doing so it also ruptured some of the hydraulic lines as it you know rolled off the wing. The subsequent problem that the pilots faced was obviously the, the, last, the lack of thrust uh, from that engine that gives uh, a yaw moment but also because the, uh, the engine had ruptured those hydraulic lines the hydraulic pressure that held the leading edge devices on the left hand wing out had disappeared. That meant that the leading edge devices retracted, which meant less uh, lift from that wing. The wing actually stalled. And when you have one wing stalled and not the other, you will end up in an uncontrolled roll towards the stalling wing, which was what happened. The aircraft uh, crashed into a trailer park um, not far from the airport and 273 people died, which made it one of the worst uh, air accidents ever on American soil. Now, in subsequent investigations after that, it was found that the, uh, the pylon had been damaged. The engine pylon had been part of an engine change that was done uh, several weeks, I think eight weeks before the accident. And a procedure that, uh, that was used was found not to be according to uh, manufacturing instructions. So the engine pylon had impacted its fitting, uh, which had bent it slightly. And when the engine was then refitted, this wasn't recognized, which led to, for each takeoff and landing after this, um, this engine change, metal fatigue started building. And on this, this flight, the metal fatigue became too much, which basically sheared the, uh, the engine off and caused the, the engine loss. Now, on top of that, this was compounded by the, the construction of the DC-10 and the fact that it didn't have a hydraulic fuse that could keep the leading edge devices out in case of a loss of hydraulic pressure. So there were several findings, as it always is um, in these kind of investigations. Um, but basically, it put a lot more focus on the maintenance procedures surrounding engine changes and specifically the, um, the metal fatigue part of the, the pylons and the engine fitting. Now the second one also has part to do with, the, with metal fatigue. It was LL flight 1862, which took off out of Amsterdam. Um, and it's Boeing 747 that shortly after takeoff had a very similar thing happening where one of its sun engines, I think, um, detached from the wing, flew over the wing, and the pilots lost control of the aircraft and it crashed into an apartment building, several um, killing some people on the ground and um, the, the crew members on board. It was a cargo flight. 
And on the subsequent investigation there, metal fatigue to one of the shear pins on that engine was found to be the likely cause of the engine actually um, letting go. So what all this all has led to is, is more uh, thorough kind of maintenance procedures and verifications of the components included in holding the engines in place. So for each one of these horrible uh, accidents, there's always been a positive point coming out of the fact that we learn. The industry takes huge pride in doing a thorough investigation into any incident or accident and from whatever is found to cause that accident, we can learn and make sure that that doesn't happen in the future. And this is what we do as an industry. We always pride ourselves in trying to work to improve flight safety overall. Now, if you have more questions about technical things, you know, why does an aircraft look like that? Why does it sound like that? And you want me to explain it, then write it in below. You know, give the uh, thumbs up to the video, give a suggestion of what I should be doing a video about in the uh, comments below and make sure that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the notification bell. Now, I do quite frequent extra videos now when things have happened in the industry that needs an explanation. And if you haven't highlighted the, uh, the, you know, the notification bell, then you might not get notified when I do these videos. So subscribe highlight the bell, have an absolutely fantastic day. And remember to check out Brilliant as well. If you want to improve on your math and your physics skills in a fun and interactive way, Brilliant is the way to go. Take care of yourself, bye-bye. Right guys, I really hope that you liked that. If you want more content like that, more aviation content, well then, check this out. Uh, I hope that you have subscribed to the channel and that you've highlighted the little notification bell. See you inside of the Mentor Aviation app and have an absolutely fantastic day. Bye-bye.